Gary Simons joined me now. He's the VP of Strategy of Pure Life Carbon, Inc. Gary, welcome. Thank you very much, and thanks for having me. Gary, a quick overview. Tell me, what is Pure Life Carbon all about? Well, literally about carbon, as the name would indicate. We essentially produce a form of biochar, an advanced form of biochar. And to explain what biochar is, it's essentially a soil amendment that has been used for thousands of years. It was used by the Incans and the Mayans way back in ancient times. And it fell out of favor as petrochemical uh, you know, nutrients and that kind of thing came to the fore. So what we've done essentially is we have created a biochar that isn't just a soil amendment. It can be used in soil as growing. So for example, if you're growing a cannabis crop in Canada, which is becoming increasingly popular, obviously, uh, then you could substitute something like rock wool or peat moss or what's called cocoa choir uh, with our biochar. And there's a number of advantages to that. You tend to get higher yields, you get less crop loss. Uh, it also stores carbon. So when you're done with it, you can actually use it as a soil amendment, put it into the soil, and it will not only use, uh, you know, improve that soil, but it will also store carbon dioxide, which, you know, improves the global warming situation. And in fact, uh, the UN panel on climate change has said that biochar is the only technology currently available that can viably reduce the impact of global warming. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So I'm obviously going to try this out as soon as I can because I'm growing uh, my regulation permitted four plants and I'm growing it in cocoa coir. And uh, so that's, that's going to be an interesting uh, experiment. Now, there are reasons that um, big, big sort of cannabis companies should be looking at this. And foremost amongst them is the uh, environmental cost of using uh, things like uh, particularly rock wool. And maybe you could outline how the cost of using rock wool compares with the cost of using uh, your product compares over the longer term. Sure. So, for example, we've been working with a uh, facility in Alberta. They've put our product uh, into their facility and side by side with rock wool. Now, the rock wool costs them somewhere around, you know, nine or ten dollars per plant. Uh, ours costs about twelve dollars per plant all in. The biggest difference, though, is in the ease of use. Ours is easier to use in general. Uh, the fact that um, with rock wool, really in Canada, you dispose of it. You know, it's going to go to the landfill and it's going to take up a lot of space. It's not going to degrade. And so it becomes a bit of an environmental hassle right now. Um, ours, on the other hand, you can send it back to us. We will process it and it can be reused completely, not just recycled, but reused. So that takes care of one problem. The other thing, too, is, of course, the sequestering of carbon which is a, a net positive and uh, will probably help you down the road with your carbon tax credits, which really cannabis companies aren't getting right now. Uh, but the big thing is that just in terms of yield, we're seeing really impressive gains with yield. Uh, so for example, in that one facility, we saw roughly about 13% on average yield increase per plant for flower, which of course is the important part. Um, in addition, the plants were ready for harvest sooner. And, and according to the grower, about two to three weeks sooner uh, than you know with a, with a standard rock wool blend. And so what that means in terms of increased yield, when we calculated it out, was about 23% increase in yield just for that. And we calculated roughly about a 47% increase in yield for that particular facility. And that, that obviously means increased revenue, increased profit, and a much lower cost of production. So those are pretty solid reasons to make a switch. Yeah, especially when I think that the, uh, the cost per unit to establish a plant does not generally include the cost of disposal of things that are ultimately toxic like rock wool. So that to me makes it very attractive. Now, um, are there any downsides to this stuff relative to the incumbent favorites, rock wool, lava, cocoa coir? Not really. I mean, cocoa, interestingly enough, the same people that were behind cocoa in the beginning are the same people that helped develop this technology. And, you know, cocoa has some advantages, uh, for sure. It's very lightweight. It's, uh, it, it doesn't have as serious a, an impact on the environment, but it's not a sterile medium. And that's the big difference between 
cocoa and then rock wool and biochar. You know, biochar and rock wool are both sterile mediums, and that's why people have been switching to them. But again, with rock wool, you do have these disposal issues. And in Europe, it's pretty highly regulated. You know, they're a much more crowded environment in Europe. Um, they also have a lot more greenhouse growing. For example, the Netherlands, it has so much greenhouse growing that that small country is the second largest exporter of food in the world by dollar value. So they have a lot of rock wool to, to dispose of, and uh, they basically have to recycle it, find some way to reuse it. And often they will just ship it out. It has to be made into things like something similar to a concrete block or into insulation, things like that, all of which is adding to the cost of using rock wool. Uh, ours, on the other hand, is just completely reusable. And that, that really is one of the major differences. Sure. Okay. Can you tell me as much as you can without giving away any company secrets as to how is this, how is this carbon black made, or this, this charred carbon? How do you make it? What are the inputs? What are the, what are the environmental impacts of producing that itself? I am going to be, unfortunately, quite cagey. I, I hate to say that, but I am going to be a bit cagey. But essentially, in very general terms, we take biomass of a type that we don't even talk about. We then use a process called pyrolysis, which is essentially we heat it in an, an anaerobic or, in other words, an environment without oxygen. So we heat it and then it turns into something that looks a lot like charcoal. Uh, now, there's biochar and there's biochar. Ours is made so that it's very hard and it does not degrade. And to think of it, think of plastic, for example. You know, there's lots of kinds of plastic. On the one hand, you could have a space age plastic that is very hard that you could use to make the exterior of, a, say, an automobile. And then you have, for example, styrofoam, two very different plastics. Same thing with, bio, with biochar. Some biochars are very soft. Uh, they degrade very quickly. Think of, say, charcoal in a campfire. You know, you pour water on it, it just turns into mush. Uh, this particular biochar is so hard that it can endure for over a thousand years. And it can be reused over that period. It can be re-sterilized uh, and then, you know, recharged with nutrients or probiotics, depending on the use, and then put back into action either in the soil or even in a soilless medium growing situation again. Um, now, what we do after the initial biochar is made, we run it through a purification process, uh, essentially taking out any possible heavy metals or anything like that. And then finally, we charge it with various things. So if certain nutrients are required within the, uh, say, a greenhouse growing environment, we add that to the biochar. Uh, biochar is interesting, too. Think of it as a sort of a hard sponge. It has a, has a you know, a, 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 to give you an idea, a square meter of our material has 10,000 acres of surface area. So it can hold a great deal of water and a great deal of nutrients in a very small amount. Mm-hmm. Okay, and finally, uh, how can investors participate in this company should they uh, determine that this is an appropriate investment for themselves? <laughs> this is a very early stage invest investment. It's a private company. This is a private placement. Uh, we're currently working with a group. It's actually a group of farmers that have uh, their own uh, fund. So it's a, a large group of farmers that have their own fund. And they're, they've committed uh, essentially about a $1.5 million uh, we're filling out the rest of the million dollars in a $2.5 million round. And essentially, they any investor who would have to be accredited, by the way, or an institutional investor or somebody of that nature, because it is a private placement, uh, could just contact me personally, and uh, I'm kind of guiding that charge. Okay, great. Gary, that's a great introduction to the company and the product. I will look forward to using it. <laughs> and uh, we'll talk to you again soon before you go public. Thanks for joining me today. Absolutely. Thank you so much.